Thanks. Um, I'm a little bit uh, not who you thought I will be, because I think the invitation um, originally went to the DG of WHO, and uh, obviously uh, she was not available, and then we played a little bit of communication back and forth, and here I am. Um, just from the start, I, I want to tell you that I work for TDR, which is a special program within WHO, but because um, the focus of today was to look at universal health coverage and how science and research can contribute to that, I'm going to do a little bit of that and then more uh, on, uh, on the program I work in. I don't have the benefit of discussions yesterday, so I may say things that you have talked about and or have set a mood here, uh, so forgive me for that. Um, I'm guessing it's like this, huh? No. Oh. Uh, you sure it's just, this is this? No, that. This one, right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, research for universal health coverage. If we look at WHO um, as an organization, a member state organization that came along in 1948, one of the institutions that were established after the several wars in the uh, 20th century, uh, research appears in its, um, in its constitution. In chapter two, it says promote and conduct research in the field of health. But the organization itself is not a research funding agency or research organization per se. Now, um, um, don't know what I said there. It's important that it's not a funding agency, but it, al it also has an interaction uh, with national governments. So it has to play a role when it comes to promoting research. In a few years back, um, we looked at what um, WHO itself did in, in research, and today about 35 departments throughout the organization do research activities, um, but that is not evenly distributed. You could see that uh, communicable diseases, maternal, perinatal, and nutritional diseases are heavily uh, skewed. Funding and research is heavily skewed there, and of course some other areas are less. My own department, TDR, has a specific focus on research, but that's not true for other parts. Uh, hold this thought in terms of the distribution of where health research is focused on, because we're going to come back to that in light of the universal health coverage issue that we're discussing here. In the last, I don't know, uh, 35 years, um, obviously the money and funding that is going to research and science that is focusing on health issues has been on the rise. There is no question that um, the most recent um, numbers up to 2009, and in fact we probably have even more than that, the number um, of billions of dollars that have been put into research has been um, uh, obviously increasing. Um, it's, as I said, in 1948 the organization said it will focus on research but it took WHO up until 1986, um, or not 86, 90, to have a special commission, just similar to that that uh, uh, Lyman mentioned on social determinants. In 1990, there was a commission on health and research. And, and some would say, sure, that was important to do, and maybe that played a role. Some of these things are difficult to... Um, linearly sort of um, link and say that because of that commission in 1990, the number and uh, investments went up. But more in interestingly is to look that in 1990, at a time when that commission um, looked at health research, only 5% was for or in low and middle income countries. Over the years, you would see there were several attempts um, committees or global forum for health research uh, that looked at the investment in health research. And most recently, um, the GFinder, which is a report that does assessment of um, investments in health research, 
you will see that that change. It's not 5%. Um, we have about um, still a huge n amount comes from public. Uh, about 66% comes from public. Uh, and, and it focuses on about, again, 31 neglected diseases. But there's a huge uh, increase in philanthropic. So you don't see that number there at the end that says philanthropic. But that's about 30% from, uh, from the previous times. And we all know that is true in, in, in many countries. And of course, Gates Foundation uh, has changed that number tremendously. Uh, so some challenges still remain in terms of how health research is funded. Um, there are large gaps in numbers. Um, sometimes we don't know oh, how much countries spend on research public um, monies from governments. There isn't really a, one standardized way to look at um, how research is defined. Everyone uh, does it their own way, in their own language, and in their own definition, uh, which is fine, but it's hard to come up with global pictures. Um, and, and, and again, OECD countries have more information than the others. And, and there isn't really a lot of transparency on the private sector, which really doesn't need to report because most of the time they report to a living donor or a dead guy who left the money, uh, so to say. Uh, and, and they don't have to report. But because they play such a big num number and role, um, that becomes extremely important. I uh, told you to hold your thought. Um, I think um, that's transition slide to tell you that what is going on in health is really a bit of a mess uh, because everyone um, has various uh, projects and initiatives. So add to the complexity here of trying to understand who funds what for research and prioritize, uh, add this picture that really is only a fragment of actually what's, what else is going on. Health has received good attention so this is nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, it suffers from uh, complexity of initiatives and overlapping priorities, etc. Um, in 2009, the WHO came up with a strategy. And the purpose of that was both internal and external. And as I said, because it plays a role in advising the ministries of health um, in countries or has a bit more of a sway with policy makers, a little bit, I guess, um, more than maybe the private philanthropic sector. This report um, or the strategy uh, was important uh, because it, it gives at least a little bit of guidance how one should go about on a national level of doing uh, funding health research or prioritizing it. And I won't go into exact detail but it basically gives uh, um, some principles. One tool that uh, is important uh, uh, to look at is how we prioritize research. Um, uh, you've seen from um, Lai Meng's presentation that things are changing. Uh, the health picture is changing, and needs are changing, priorities are changing. But how to move from what we fund today into what we will need to fund tomorrow one of the things that that um, uh, strategy gave was the sort of priority setting checklist that helps uh, to prioritize or move from one area to another. I mean, you probably come from uh, institutions that have their own challenges of switching from one agenda to another. Um, and it's not that easy, especially if, if uh, money has been invested in certain areas. It's hard to overnight switch it to something else. Um, remember I showed you the um, skewed distribution of uh, funding at WHO when it comes to uh, needs? Same happens in countries, and I picked Brazil. Um, there's a source to that, so don't blame me. Uh, I didn't come up with this. But if you look at Brazil, same thing in terms of communicable diseases there, then non-communicable diseases less, and health systems, something that we need to talk about, let's say, in light of universal coverage or how to achieve universal coverage, still remains a, a smaller proportion. Now, this is in 2004 to 9, published in 2011. It may not be the same. 
and, and, and this is not, not to uh, point a finger, but to, just to say that some of these things are changing, but not as fast in terms of helping with, with, the, with the universal health coverage um, um, sort of goal. Um, some of you may have heard uh, that another process that is going on amongst the member states of WHO over the last 10 years um, um, among your own governments and your representatives at the World Health Assembly is what is um, a goal to come up with coordinated mechanism at a global level. There was a report of a consultative expert group on, um, on research and, and development um, that really looked at different, different ways and as a result the um, assembly a couple of years ago, the World Health Assembly, basically the ministries of health and the member states of all uh, countries have agreed to these four things basically to come up an observatory uh, based at WHO that will look at the research and development, what's going on, who is funding what at a global level not an easy thing, not either cheap and or doable, considering the issues around how you classify research and who reports and where you get the data. Coordination, all that picture I showed you, um, try to come up with mechanisms that will help all these funding mechanisms to come together and prioritize together and fund things in a more coordinated manner. Of course, financing, um, and there are various uh, schools to that, everything from a universal tax on all countries to voluntary funds, and that still continues to, to go on, and some demonstration projects. And I won't go more into this, but just to say that at the global level, um, the ministries of health and ministers of health, your own ministers, go to these meetings and discuss this. So I don't know how much in, you know or have an influence or are asked to provide guidance on this, but just to say things are happening there, and although slowly. Okay. Universal health coverage. Okay, so each year WHO comes up with a report with for the day of World Health Day. In 2013, the World Health Report focused on research for universal health coverage. So if the, the title of this session is Research or Science for Universal Health Coverage, this fits in. Uh, what was very unorthodox about this report is that it looked at case studies to illustrate the role and need of health research for universal health coverage. And they included things like observational studies, something that before it was really not that easy to do. Uh, it was not seen as pure science. Or they included some sort of um, um, more non-traditional examples of how operational implementation research can help. So I won't go into the detail, but just to say that um, this could be a good tool uh, for us uh, to promote. And I'll give you some examples here. Um, you maybe have heard many times this quote from Dr. Chan in 2012 when uh, she took on this challenge of universal health coverage and promoting with the member states and the countries that you showed the map, the, you saw the map that is not entirely there, uh, not even close, that public health um, and universal health coverage for public health are the, uh, one of the most powerful things we can do. So that continues, um, and, and what's the role of research? Uh, role of research in questions like um, the understanding of the gap in financial risk protection. If you look at um, the map here, you'll see that in many countries, out-of-pocket expenditures in high are quite high, and, but these things are not understood and, and well-researched. If we look at um, why we still need to do research in universal health coverage, you will see that only half of the people with HIV who are eligible for treatment um, are actually receiving it. So we don't know why the rest do not get it. And it's not because we need research on the HIV drugs, but we need research on how to get these things to them. 
Same with TB. Um, um, same issues, about uh, fewer than 7% of TB cases were detected and reported and, and were still true in, 2000, in 2010 and 12. So those things are not changing. They need research to, uh, to be overcome. Another issue here, uh, comparing Philippines and Ukraine, of how the incidence of catastrophic health expenditures, those that are really the hazard of non-universal health uh, systems, um, uh, a lot of the issues um, around that are still not well understood. And you will see in comparison, for example, the, um, how the uh, out-pocket you know, payments in, uh, impact poverty. Some of these issues are not researched and they're not completely in health area. Um, equity. Um, we can talk about universal health coverage, and I think um, uh, you uh, alluded to that, that on paper you could have universal health coverage. It does not mean that everybody gets it. Uh, let's say maternal child health services in places where there's an attempt to have it universal, and still those who have more money or wealthy uh, quintiles of um, populations are those who um, uh, are, are receiving it. So within, and it's a complex slide, but the point here is that within um, certain populations, uh, again, there is a lot of inequality and inequity, and we need to do more research to address that. Um, OECD countries are not any better, and here uh, the issue is not quantity, but quality. You will see from Denmark to Slovenia or Belgium, um, in terms of the fatality rates following ischemic stroke after admission to uh, hospital, you'll see that the, uh, the rates are quite different. So you may have the uh, service, but the outcomes are different. So a lot more needs to be done. Although we know the treatment and it, it, it should be the same, but the outcomes and quality are not the same. <clears throat> I have three more case studies, and, and then I'll switch to another topic. And, 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 and again, uh, the idea here is to show, and this is from the report, that we have powerful examples how doing research um, in universal health coverage is the only answer to actually get there because throwing more money or more funding at uh, pr the problem is not going to solve it. And, and, and one example is on antiretroviral therapy and, and how um, after um, the, 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 uh, the uh, in nine countries where this was done, um, basically the, the message here is that um, 96% reduction in, in, in transmission of HIV was achieved in, in these countries because of the implementation research done with these people. Similarly, um, the obstetrics uh, care in uh, reducing maternal mortality, and there is an example from Burundi how that number went down um, tremendously just because in, in they've had um, good understanding of, of, of what's going on and, and what the issues are. Maybe something that um, closer uh, in this region as well, uh, although this is a global meeting, conditional cash uh, transfers and, and the examples in, in, in Brazil, Colombia, Honduras, Malawi, and Mexico and Nicaragua, how um, this um, research has helped to um, introduce, introduce this um, cash transfers and, and how research in this area help to increase demand for health services. So key messages from that report, and I'll, I'll switch to another topic, um, um, and I, st I, th I still think I have 10 minutes. Again, universal coverage cannot be achieved without evidence from research. Sounds that we all know this, sounds um, motherhood and apple pie, uh, but it's not always um, easy to keep up on making sure that it is part of every health program. Um, research can address very wide range of questions, 
including coverage or um, other issues that are not perceived as pure science in a way. Uh, again, maybe I'm speaking to a part of this audience that may uh, throw uh, uh, um, rotten tomatoes at me. Uh, but, um, and, and the other point of the, uh, of the report is that all nations, it's not an issue of only um, countries who are able to fund research. Even from the case studies and examples that you had, uh, all nations, low or middle or high income countries, all need to invest in research for universal health coverage that if they want to achieve this uh, result. Um, from, the, from, from the experience of the country I come from, um, um, Canada has universal health coverage, but it also throws a lot of money at it. It's not because um, it's, it's that easy to do. So we can always be smarter uh, in, in how to use this. Um, and, and some other points specifically uh, as well on research capacity, which also I think dovetail nicely with the, uh, with the um, earlier presentation. Now I'm gonna move to the next part, which is more, um, just a little bit, two examples of how capacity strengthening uh, can help. And I almost would not be able to come here if I didn't speak of the program that I work in. Um, so uh, to take time from work for two days, I cannot uh, afford not do that. But I think it's very relevant. Uh, so TDR is basically been around for 40 years. This year we're celebrating 40 years of, of the program. We focus on um, tropical diseases, but infectious diseases, now that's what we uh, call. How many of you have heard of TDR? Okay, so three out of 40, okay, four, okay. But again, um, the, in, in the recent years, and, and this is also an example how priorities have changed, and it took TDR about 10 years and two crises to switch from funding um, drugs, trials, uh, to uh, focusing on implementation and operational research. And I'm, I, this is my own experience of my own program. So I'm, I'm not shying away from saying that even within um, an, an, a program that is funded by um, a lot of development assistance money, et cetera, it took about 10 years to switch from uh, funding um, traditional uh, sort of research in, in, in products to focusing on implementation research for universal health coverage. Um, mm, what happened? Okay, good. So why focus on implementation research um, or operational research? Um, and, and again, these are um, sort of ways to show how uh, sort of the uh, need goes from um, using the interventions or technologies that we also have, already have, um, and, 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 and some of them may not be effective when used within the routine system or real life system, uh, setting. So um, here is also where the capacity strengthening part comes in. And part of our program is, um, major part of it is now to invest in capacity strengthening for operational and implementation research. We have two um, uh, examples. One is uh, sorted, a structured operational research and training initiative. And we also have produced an implementation research toolkit. And, and, and basically helping uh, the health system, um, health workers or those interested in the health system uh, to switch from either doing research if they are not doing research in operational and implementation research area of the program they work in, or if they've been trained in more um, basic science to basically acquire some knowledge in terms of how to do operational research. So it's more product oriented. They have to provide a research paper at the end, and that training only has about three modules and it takes about a year. You don't have to leave your job for that. So what basically happens is that implementers, those who work in the health system, um, they get together about 12 participants in total per course, 
And again, it's three modules that are done in different times. Um, and at the end of the day, they bring your own da research data, they do data analysis, and at the end, they have a publication. I won't go into more detail. The other uh, example is implementation research toolkit. Uh, while it's easy to say, it's sometimes not easy to be understood what we mean by implementation research, but implementation research for universal health coverage, in our case for diseases of poverty, infectious diseases of poverty, but this could be used for any sort of health issue. Um, this toolkit basically gives a workbook, a workbook, a facilitator's guide, and a PowerPoint slide set uh, that also is purpose to, if you're trained in social science or if you're trained in health systems research or any other um, basic or molecular uh, biology or whatever, it doesn't really matter. If you work in the health system, you can do implementation research uh, because you're equipped with already with uh, research and, and, and scientific skills. And, and, and basically, this toolkit is bringing this multidisciplinary implementers, health administrators, researchers, policy makers, to bringing them together and, and, and working over this toolkit so they can look at the issues that they work with in the system uh, that they know of because they work in that system. Uh, there are various steps uh, you will see and, and in terms of uh, when you have to contextualize your challenge in the health system, what is the problem, we have something, but we can't resolve. How to develop a proposal, a plan uh, to conduct research in this area. Uh, who to engage, and that's important because one kind of set of skills is not going to do in this in one system these days uh, because of the um, nature of the health problems. Analyze, present, and most importantly, uh, disseminate. And this. Step five, usually, well, at least what we've seen, is an absent part of about 80% of research that is done. Because just publishing it in a journal, uh, it does the trick, but it doesn't, depending what the goal is. But when it comes to health system change, this step number five is extremely important. So again, that toolkit is available for, uh, on, on our website if anybody is interested and I can answer more questions. But basically it has sort of discussions, lectures, analysis of case studies, etc. And, and the um, target audience, as I said, is very, very, very different. You have anything from health providers to uh, decision makers, to researchers, financial and administrative people, media. And, and, and ethics committee, uh, committees in, 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 in countries or in institutions. So in each part kind of speaks to different uh, parts to it. As I said, it's available on the website. Um, if you go somewhere, even if you write up toolkit and TDR, it will come up, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Now, I am going to stop now. Thank you.